Okay? Yes. Good evening. This is the 13th city of a 36th city tour. This is one third. And so every other night or every night, we meet again. And it's interesting to question why we meet. I mean, why? Why would you pay that outlandish amount of money to come here, somebody named Ramdas? I mean, it's not me you come to hear. Because if I thought it was that, I'd think I had to know something you didn't. It'd be very frightening. Because I know there are people in this audience that know everything I know, and more. <clears throat> There's a great Rinpoche in this audience, whom I admire deeply. Now, I, I experience myself in these evenings as a, a mouthpiece for a process I say it good. I'm a rent-a-mouth. <laughs> and you have rented me to say good what you know to be true. Because if you thought it wasn't true, you'd say, what does he know? Or, I don't know about that guy. So this is a process whereby we talk to ourselves. yes, all of us. <laughs> and we talk to ourselves about the things that we we share our wisdom. We share our wisdom. I don't say we share our knowledge. We share our wisdom. We share something that we intuitively know. It's easy to say knowledge. It's much harder to say wisdom. That's why they say, one who knows does not speak and one who speaks does not know. That always presented me with a challenge each evening. <laughs> Till I realized I was both of them. The one that's speaking doesn't, and the one that isn't does. So we come to share something that is barely conceptual. In fact, the greatest part of it isn't. So we come, in a sense, to share being, as opposed, if you have to oppose it, to knowing, although those aren't really in opposition. We come to share wisdom. We come to share a quality of presence together. We come to share a place where we feel safe. Partly, I think, many of us suffer from having so long felt things that weren't consistent with the way the outside world seemed to be. I mean, for a long time, I have felt that we are a family, that humanity is a family. And yet, the outside world didn't seem to act that way. And so, so for so long, you and I have lived with 
living with political structures, social structures, economic structures that act as if there are them, it's not all us. And yet we know in our gut we are all us. That dissonance or tension that exists, it makes us like closet compassioners, you know. And it's not like the outside institutions don't include our own persona, by the way. I mean, who we think it is and how we, who we think we are and how we think it is is part of the social institution. Our ego is part of the social institutions. It's a, it's a product of the culture. So your habits of thought are all part of the external world, which is dissonant from this inner place where we are wise, where we understand about love and truth. And it's a moment many, many years ago where I was um, in Hota Villa, Arizona with the Hopi elders. I was a representative from the hippies of San Francisco, and we came to arrange a Hopi hippie bee-in in Grand Canyon. <laughs> that was a previous incarnation. And we met around a kitchen table, and there were five elders, and they ranged from 65 to about 110 years old. And there were only five chairs, so I sat on the other side on the floor with my nose around table height so I could see underneath these beings with hands that were like roots and their legs planted firmly in the earth, on the earth. And there were beautiful turquoise and there was just a quality of beauty and presence and simplicity and strength. And they were explaining to me why they didn't trust the white men. I mean, they were overlooking the fact that we had attempted to commit total genocide on them. He said, um, the youngest of them, who was about 65, was speaking, and he said, uh, there was an accident a few days ago between one of our young men and a vehicle driven by the, uh, belonging to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And it turned out the Bureau of Indian Affairs vehicle was over the yellow line, or marks to show that. But the next day, the state police found a bottle in the gutter, and they said our young man had been drinking, which would have changed culpability. And he said, we called in the young man, and we asked him, and he said he had not been drinking. And then he looked at me, and he said, and he spoke truth. And the way he said that, you know how when you hear a voice and you hear the vibration of a voice, sometimes you just know that's the way it is. And a chill ran through me because it was so long since I had trusted that world of truth. I, mean, I grew up in a family of lawyers. We just assume everything is a law. I mean, you just... It's like in science, you assume the null hypothesis. You know, you say, there is no difference till you prove otherwise. And in law, you say, the lawyers say, everybody's dishonest unless we protect each other from our own dishonesty. They don't have to be that way, by the way. The lawyers can be speakers of truth as well. But the myths of our culture make that hard. And I felt this feeling when he said that. It was a kind of a, like a memory. It was like a whisper across time, a memory from a deep place inside of myself where we spoke to each other as it is. Not as a public opinion poll says it should be or da, da, da. In, in India, they have um, periods, these huge long time periods, kalpas and yugas. 
And in the first yuga, the very pure yuga, the very pure period, the bull of truth is standing on four legs. And then in the second yuga, it's only standing on three legs. The third yuga, only two legs. And in the fourth yuga, Oliver North is saying, yes, I lied to Congress. I did it for the good of the world. And everybody's going like that. Because the bull's only on one leg. It's called the Kali Yuga, or the Dark Age. And somehow I remembered the time of the Sat Yuga, the time of the pure age, when people said to each other how it is. And I realized how much I wanted to live in that kind of a world. A world of innocence, a world without guile. My guru, when he wanted to praise me, he would say, Ramdas is so simple. And when he really wanted to put me down, he'd say, that Ramdas is very clever. <laughs> There are things we know inside, you and I, that we are not living outside. And many of us, we keep trying. We keep trying to have integrity in our lives so that what we know, so that our wisdom is manifest in our actions. And it's funny because we treated like the Native Americans like they were, really like they were shit. I mean, we, we just felt they're primitive and simple and what do they know? But they understood the relation of humans to earth, to other animals, to nature, to cycles, to God, to spirit. They knew what we now need to know to save ourselves from what we thought we knew. <laughs> Is that pushing you too hard? <laughs> and now we turn around and honor them. Yeah. Mm. Mm. We often have this incredible tension in us between our, I'd say, our intellect and our intuitive heart. Now, there is a way to use the intellect as an instrument, but not to be, it's not a good master. Because what it, what it represents is the, um, it's like the control mechanism for the spacesuit we went into when we took incarnation on this plane. It's control central for the, the spacesuit. It's who I think I am and how I think it is. It's the computer, and it's sending messages very quickly to keep you standing upright and saying hello and no and yes, and having opinions and attitudes and thinking you're somebody. That's all a function of this central computer. It's well programmed, believe me. Because you and I both, when we were born, went into somebody training. Because our parents thought they were somebody, so... They obviously taught us to be somebody, too. We went into our separateness training. We went into our self-consciousness. We went into our ego structures. We went into...
our individualism. And that was all a necessary part of incarnation. There's no way, you don't not, you don't skip that unless you just drop down as a bodhisattva to wish us well, you know. <laughs> like, like Christ, for example, something like that. Krishna. One point, Krishna was a baby, Gopala, and he was in his mother's arms and she was rocking him. And Krishna, of course, was playing the whole thing out because Krishna wasn't caught in an incarnation. He was just playing with it, as we would be if we weren't who we thought we were. So <laughs> Gopala is being rocked by Krishna, and at one point Gopala opens his mouth, uh, I mean Krishna is by his mother, and at one point the baby Krishna, Gopala, opens his mouth, and the mother sees in his mouth the entire universe, all the planets and stars and all that, and she freaks. Okay. And then it says, and then he once again veiled her eyes with mother love. Wow, isn't that tasty? Veiled her eyes with mother love. Because the love that would exist between the living spirit and the devotee is such a bright light. So it's such intense love. So it's veiled. The predicament with the power of the mind to structure the universe, to protect our separateness, because that's what its job is, is that it begins to see this other part of us, the, the, the heart, as um, an enemy. That's the hard thing. Because the quality of the heart, un, the innocent heart, the un, uncontrolled by the mind, is that the statement, my heart goes out to you. The quality of the heart is it's like being in love. If I'm in love with you, I bring you flowers. I bring you breakfast. Take what you need. You need to use the car, you need the house. What do you need? Let me serve you. I love you. That's the heart. The mind, on the other hand, is saying, now wait a minute. Is this person worthy of that? Won't that be a commitment? This incredible tension because the heart, and I'm talking about the deeper heart, the sin sin, the intuitive heart mind, the Chinese call it the sin sin, the Buddha mind. I'm talking about the deep quality of Christ consciousness, of the spirit of Allah, of uh, Yahweh, the Atman. That part of us is the lilies in the field. That part of us is part of the universe. It has no boundaries. There are no boundaries. There's no them. There's no there. There's no this and that. There are no preferences or opinions or attitudes. It's just like trees and rivers and rocks. It's all just part of it. We are part of it. <laughs> we already started out as part of it. And then we got, we got to think we were somebody. It's very lonely out here. We like cut ourselves off from the family. And the heart knows that. And so the mind and the heart, there was this incredible image I have. Uh, last year I was teaching at St. John the Divine in New York. It was co-sponsored by the Seva Foundation uh, and St. John the Divine and Open Center in New York and WBAI. And all the students in the course who were people like us, including me, had to, as part of the course, participate in some 
community service around homelessness. It could be uh, shelters, or it could be f soup kitchens, or it could be political action against uh, um, greedy real estate development projects, or whatever, against the government for its policies about housing. And each person kept a diary, and then we had an open mic, and we shared what we were learning. This one woman said, I'm in a shell, working at a shelter, shelter, but that isn't really what I want to talk about. She said, every day I leave my apartment and I go to uh, the bus and uh, my store. And she said, uh, for the past year, at the corner of my street, I've been mostly, most every day, passing this uh, man who was begging. And she said, I uh, got in the habit, I give him a quarter every now and then. Sometimes I wouldn't, sometimes I was. In my mind, I started to cultivate a mental budget, you know, like 250 a week or something like that, you know. This has been going on for a year now, you know. She said, but as a result of this course, I suddenly realized that I had never acknowledged his existence. And she said, I examined why that was. She said, I realized I was afraid. What was I afraid of? I wasn't afraid that he was going to rape me. I wasn't going afraid he was going to steal my pocketbook. I mean, it was broad daylight and we'd known each other for a year. No, he said, she said, I was afraid he'd end up living in my apartment. Because if I open my heart, how could I set the boundaries? I mean, then he's not just this man that's hungry out on the street. He's family. What are you going to say to family? You know, your uncle, your brother comes down the street, they're hungry. You say, here's a quarter. Okay. You don't do that. It's, it's family. I may not like it, but it's family. Or I may love it. That's the right, right there is one of the edges. I may not like it, I may love it. See, if you've, if you've been so busy with your individuality that you've separated yourself from family, then if the family needs something, it's a begrudging thing you do for the family. If, on the other hand, you've developed individuality, but at the same time you've kept your identity as a member of the family, then if the family needs you, it just pulls that part of you that's part of the family into doing it. It's not begrudging or judging or deciding. It's just, yeah. Those are part of the harmonies of life that we are learning to listen to. See, the fear that you will give away the store or that you will not be able to set boundaries is the fear that the heart will function without the mind. But the mind is part of the incarnation. It's part of being impeccable on this plane. This plane, your mind serves to discriminate this and that. And you can do it. You don't have to. But as Kabir said, do what you do, but don't ever put anyone out of your heart. Yes, no, but not yes and no. You, know, you disagree with people, but you don't turn them off. Gandhi said, I want the English to leave India as friends. And they did, in a way. Now, one of the balances that you and I are listening for is the balance between our individuality and our unity, between our separateness and our connectedness. How do you be unique and still part of the dance? It's by getting over the fact, the idea that unique means special. And special means superior. 
we have these achievement myths in our culture. The becoming somebody myths. I mean, the winner of such a myth is somebody like Donald Trump. Well, laugh may you may. However, he is one of the winners of that myth. He's what America produced. Now, I think, to me, that is an obscenity. And I'm not saying he's an obscenity. He's just a poor schnook that got caught in the role. I mean, somebody has to play it. It's like the Indian maidens. You worship for a year and then you murder them. You know? It's a sacrificial act. We have to have myth fillers like that. You know? Somebody's got to do it. Poor guy's got to do it. You begin to see how everybody has to play a part. And it blows your mind, doesn't it? <laughs> I remember I was up at uh, Mount Savior Monastery in uh, Pine City, New York, with the Benedictine monks in a retreat. And Father Damasius, this German scholar, rosy cheeked, little plump fellow, his 60s or early 70s, called me into his study after uh, one of the offices of the day. And he said, he took my hands, he said, Ramdas, I only have one question for you. He said, what was the meaning of the kiss between Judas and Jesus? And I said, hopefully, it was an appreciation of the dance. And he giggled, and we danced around the desk. <laughs> I mean, with that, the, what we were appreciating was the one that lies behind the two. We were appreciating that behind good and evil, there is the one. And out of the one comes the dance. And the dance has the Judases and the Jesuses and the whole mishpacha. It's a Sanskrit word for family. You and I are hearing the nature of our, our connection to family and to family and to family and the family of our blood and the family of our community and the family of our nation state and the family of our ecosystem and the family of all the species and the family of all the planets and the family of beings before God and all the children of God and all the oneness. We, we, there's a part of us that knows all this. We exist in so many identities as different members of different families. We're not just Americans or women or Caucasian or Hispanic. Or bipeds. Or oh, cells of consciousness on the body of Gaia. It's a nice one. I mean, we are all these things. Gurdjieff said we were food for the moon. That's a nice one. See, the escape from prison for us is the recognition that we are all of these identities and none of them. The minute you think you're somebody, it gets really stifling. Have you noticed that? Do you notice how hard it is to keep your somebody going all the time? <laughs> Don't you kind of get bored with yourself? <laughs> I mean, do I have to be me forever? No, you never were. You've just been thinking you were. Oh, my God. This is better than Gary Trudeau comics.
funny, when you first realize you're kind of cramped in the prison of your mind, in the who what you think you are, you know, and you've been living in it, it's got curtains and all this stuff. So you really get uncomfortable about it. You know something's wrong because it, ugh, you know, is this all there is? Oh, shit, you know. So you go to a therapist and they help you rearrange the furniture. Because <laughs> most of them think they're therapists. And if they are, you must be the patient. And we must just reorganize our somebodyness. If you're lucky, you get a therapist who thinks they're nobody. See, when you, when you keep opening to all the somebodies you are, I'm this and I'm that and I'm that and I'm that, you begin to feel the mosaic of this incredible, rich thing, and then you realize that you're also none of it. That's a little scary. That's like nirvana. The form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. But do you see, if you only hang out in the somebody side of it and don't really examine the nobody side of it, you're missing a large part or a large non-part of who you aren't. <laughs> oh, it's so hard to talk about these things, isn't it? <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> That's what's fun about talking to you. <laughs> I mean, other people wouldn't know what we're talking about. <laughs> See, part of why we come together is because we all think we're crazy, and we collectively say, well, here we are, you know, look, there's a lot of us, isn't this incredible? <laughs> Remember the story of the king who, uh, his wise men came in and said, sire, I'm sorry to report that uh, the wheat has been poisoned and everybody that eats it is going to go mad. And so all your, uh, all the members of people in the kingdom are going to go mad, your constituents, your subjects. But I fortunately saved enough wheat from last year's crop for you and me, so we needn't go mad. So the king paced back and forth. What would be the sense, he said, of being sane if all my subjects are mad? No, I think we'll go mad too, but let's put a mark on each other's forehead so when we meet, we'll know we're mad. See? See? See, and that's you and I. We're meeting, living, we are living like we're mad. I mean, you must see that this whole thing is madness, <laughs> but we know it. Isn't that far out? I think it's far out. <laughs> So that many of us, I think, are really examining our nobodiness. We're what you'd call a nobody training. And then you end up nobody appearing to be somebody, which is what Don Juan called controlled folly. It's not fraudulence. It's delighting in the game or the play or the leela or the dance. It's very light. But how do you get up out of the melodrama so you can enjoy the dance? Because the melodrama really sucks you in, doesn't it? I mean, I'm really real, you know. Yeah. See, the one that really gets somebody is death. 
because somebody always dies. Nobody, on the other hand, doesn't die. Wavy Gravy, who is one of the wise beings of the Seva Foundation, he's on the board, he's an incredible being, he's a clown, among other things. He's, for the past few years at a presidential elections, run nobody for president. And he has a big bus that says nobody for president. And, and uh, he has slogans like, nobody can solve our economic problems. <laughs> you know? our, uh, really good one is, nobody cares. <laughs> so, What he points out is that nobody received more votes than all the other candidates combined in the last election. That's extraordinary, isn't it? And while we may not have mastered nobodyness, so that we are unique but not special, we just, more of it. <laughs> I'm more of it, aren't you? No, I'm special. Ha. <laughs> <Huh. laughs> we'll wait. <laughs> You'll despair of that. Try another 10,000 lives. <laughs> What's the rush? Ah. <laughs> uh. Hmm. While we may not have mastered our nobodiness yet, we're sort of aimed in that direction. I mean, after we spent all those years becoming somebody, now we're sort of getting free of all that. Not getting, not pushing it away, not selling it or anything but just getting free of it so that you can be in it, but not of it, so you can play with it. There was an interesting Sufi line that I always said, I've used it for years, but I've always translated it wrong, it turns out. I used to translate it always, trust in Allah, but tie your camel. See? See? The correct translation, however, is trust in Allah and tie your camel. T altogether different. And meaning, and also. Not but. Not as if tying your camel is a failure of, of faith. But I have faith and I tie my camel because that's my part. The beautiful mystic statement, one who is free stands nowhere. See, at first you're standing on earth and then you start to awaken and you realize you're not who you thought you were. You're not just this body and this personality and all that. So then you want to get high all the time, which means get over this trap, get out of the prison cell. You want to get out there. So you keep getting out there, but you keep coming back and getting out there and coming back. And for me, I then became a renunciate. I decided, yick, I'm not going back. I'm pushing it away. Which left me sort of a horny celibate. <laughs> See, because it wasn't honoring my humanity. It was just making my humanity as if it was some kind of error. I remember saying to my spook friend, Emmanuel, uh, it's a being that doesn't have a body. Um, it's great having a friend like that, I'll tell you, because uh, they already died, so they know lots about it. We have too, but we, act, we don't know, we know. So I said to Emmanuel, what am I doing here? Like, who made this error? He said, Ramdas, you're in school. Why don't you try taking the curriculum? <laughs> I 
I mean, I never thought I was taking Humanity 101, you know. <laughs> and if I was going to pass the course, I had to be human. I couldn't fake it. <laughs> I appear to be human, but really. <laughs> See, that isn't what game playing means. Game playing is you really play the game. You're in it, but you're not of it. You're in it. You're totally involved, passionately involved. And yet, you're at the same moment empty. Not empty in the indifference sense. Empty in the equanimous sense, the sense of equanimity. You're resting in the place where it all is. Ah, so. And you're also fully human. Oh, God. <laughs> Not that. No. Ah, ye, oh, oh. Yeah. You're in both of them simultaneously, and many more. As you start to rest in these planes so that you, in a sense, have a much broader context for living life, and you realize that you are free through your involvement, not in spite of it. That if for an incarnate to be free means free in form, not free out of, you don't have to, the mistaken concept of freedom is that you're free from form. But it's being free within form. You're so perfectly in the form that you're free. It's not pushing and it's not pulling. It's just surrendering into what is. It's hearing your uniqueness. It's like last fall, I um, ripped my Achilles tendon. I'll take you through three funny things. I, I ripped my Achilles tendon, just cut it right across, ripped it. Everybody goes, ugh. Playing tennis. Ah in France. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, it was still ripped. And um, so I did the whole thing to let it heal by itself. And after three months, I took off the cast and it broke again because it didn't heal. Uh, so I went, decided to go in for surgery. So I went in and I had to be examined by the hospital to protect itself from me. Um, <laughs> It's reasonable. I mean, I'm a menace to the... Every patient is a potential enemy. Isn't that a far-out system to we've evolved? It's really hard to be compassionate under those conditions, you know. <laughs> so they were giving me a physical, and so I was in this room naked, and this doctor walked in. He said, how do you do? I'm Dr. So-and-so. And I said, I, how do you do? I'm a 58-year-old Caucasian male. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> but see, when I walked into the hospital, I realized who I had become. I mean, you know, that's who you are. That's how you're relevant. I said, I could have said I'm a broken Achilles tendon. Would that help? <laughs> you don't want to know about my childhood, you know, psychological scars, do you? It's being in the part. It's being in it fully. And as you and I are beginning to accept the intuitive wisdom that we are more than who we thought we were and that we can meet behind it and there is a quality of being and being here now and all that sort of thing, that there's really, there is a shift in consciousness because there is a shift that occurred where we went from thinking the reality that our minds created was absolutely real to seeing that it's relatively real. We did that in the 60s. We started to do that. Einstein did that to physics.
And as you begin to appreciate that that's true, that there are relative realities and you exist on many of them, you begin to delight in situations that wake you up to where you got stuck thinking a reality was real. Like, well, look what Eastern Europe's governments are doing to us. Their experiments in democracy after the years of repression are mirroring for us our own democracy. And the ways we have linked democracy and economics and lost some of the social and moral aspects of what democracy was about, which was allowing a system that would maximize the potential for every human being in that society. We certainly don't do that. And we have thousands of justifications in our minds of why we don't. So those of us who want to wake up are delighted by this state of affairs. As the United States loses its economic hegemony in the world, and suddenly we're just one of the team, you know, we're one of the gang. We're not the United States. Those of us that want to grow are delighted. Wow, ooh, new moment. It's interesting to examine in your life whether change is your enemy. It's interesting how we build these models of expectation in our mind that have continuity to them. And then when change is impending or starts to happen, we get frightened because of the dissonance The economic one is a great one. The instability at this moment between the haves and the have-nots, the north-south monetary structures, the fact that there are so many more people in the world that are hungry, starving, and landless than that are rich and secure and landed. That is an unstable situation. And the people that are the many aren't indefinitely going to wait for the altruistic trickle-down effect. Because something isn't right. You can feel it in your heart. And the problem is, there's a great line from um, Livy who wrote about the... Um, He wrote about the downfall of the Roman Empire, and he said, we cannot bear our vices or their cure. That the system we have lived in and the myths we've lived with have created this disparity. 
and we can't live with it. But the cure we don't really want to face. It's interesting that the myths, the basic myths of our society come out of the myths of the Bible, the Old and New Testament, and the myths of the Republic, like in the old Greek Republic. And in both of those sets of myths, the system works, but it doesn't really support a great disequilibrium of wealth, great disparity in wealth between the rich and the poor. It has a concept of the common good in it. And you and I who have touched the fact that we are connected to other beings and have unity, we also have touched the sense of common good. It's known as the higher wisdom. If you can handle one more fact, it's interesting to me that both the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were worked upon by roughly about 55 people, of which 50 of them were Freemasons. And the Freemasons were not like the Masons of today for the most part. They were, the Freemason was a living spiritual practice, which acknowledged that there was a higher wisdom than, than rational knowledge. And it's said that the whole system works only so long as those two are in relation to each other. And it called upon the leaders always to fulfill that function of being in the relation between the worldly knowledge and that higher wisdom. If you look on the dollar bill, that pyramid with the, the little parts separated with the eye in it, that's the two forces that make up the total pyramid or the total game. And when that disparity, economic disparity, gets too great, and it's very funny about this economic disparity, there's a study that shows that people that make 15,000, the study is concerning realizing one's dreams. That was the question. I don't know if it was Gallup or Roper or somebody. 50, the people that made 15,000 said, if I made 50,000, I would realize my dreams. People that made 50,000 said, if I made 100,000, I would realize my dreams. But then note this added statistic. The added question was, have you realized your dreams? Of those making 15,000, 5%, only 5% said they had realized their dreams. Of those making 100,000, 6% said they had realized their dreams. Does it seem worth it? It's interesting whether the, econo whether the unit in a democratic society should be an economic one, should be the consumer, workman, um, be a cipher within the gross national product as the criterion of health.
So if you and I both know something deep within ourselves, and yet we are living in a system that is unstable, as that system tries to correct itself, you and I will feel that that correction is bringing us into deeper integrity between the inner and the outer part of ourselves. And so we will, although it will be frightening, we will feel its deeper truth. And that yearning for integrity will allow us to be in that process of writing that disequilibrium with gentleness. And that's part of the part you and I have to play in our society in these 10 years before the millennium. Because there are accelerated changes going on in the world, and those changes, to the extent that you are frightened by those changes in view of everything you know, how about the people who think they are somebody and that's all they got? And then it's all starting to be up for grabs. That must really be scary. I mean, if you think that you are your body and you're dying, wow, bye-bye. On the other hand, if you know that the body is just one part of it and it's just going through its metamorphosis, ah, so. The Zen monk who's dying and he hasn't written his death poem and his students are freaking. And they say, Master, you're a death poem. And he, oh, he picks up his brush and he calligraphies madly and he dies. And the calligraphy says, birth is thus, death is thus, verse or no verse, what's the fuss? Do you hear the lightness, the lightness? Another flower falls into the stream and floats away. When oh, India dying is called dropping the body. And Ramana Maharshi, the beautiful Indian saint, when says, when his he was dying of cancer, and they said, Bhagwan, don't die, don't die. And his devotees were all crying, and he looked confused. He said, don't be silly. Where could I go? <laughs> I'm just selling the Ford. I mean, you know. But there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be very afraid because there are going to be a lot of changes because the whole system is unstable. Politically. I mean, we're dealing now as a fascinating thing ecologically because we've got a political structure that goes roughly the units are two to six years. And yet we're dealing with problems like nuclear waste, which has a half-life of toxicity of, or a life of toxicity of 250,000 years. Well, what are you going to do with this stuff? Well, um, we've done some research and we've created these barrels that are, we're going to put it underground in these salt places in these barrels. Well, is it going to work? Oh, yes. Have you tested it? Yes. For 250,000 years? A hundred times longer than written history, than civilization? No, we're hypothesizing. Oh, ho, 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 I see. New Mexico, where they're hypothesizing by building a two-mile uh, underground garage for our nuclear excretion, ex excretia, waste. 
where the salt's going to compress on the barrels and everybody's going to be safe forever except the salt leaks. Because the theory isn't right, but we've already got 850 million in it, so what are you going to do? So there was a memo in the Department of Energy which called uh, southern New Mexico a, um, quote, a sacrifice zone, which the people of New Mexico didn't get off on too much. And here are politicians who have to get reelected in two, four, six years dealing with something 250,000 years long. As long as they don't have it explode in their faces before the next election. The Indians talk about protecting things to the seventh generation. We're talking about 700 or 7,000 or something like that. So as things change, I mean, it's one thing to stop using styrofoam cups. It's another thing to separate your bottles and your cans and your newspapers. But when you get to changing your driving habits and starting to live more simply, and with style of life really changes, well, you can't do as many things. It's great because you won't always feel rushed. <laughs> I mean, you don't have time already for all the things you're doing, so. Why are you doing them, by the way? Isn't that interesting? Everybody's saying, I don't have time. Why don't they have time? They have as much time as we ever had. <laughs> There's so many opportunities. You're drowning in greed. I want more things, and I don't have time. Because if I'm eating, I can't be... See, we can do a lot of things, but as it gets really a little more hairy, the question is whether you will have the context of realizing you aren't just the game. If you have the bigger context, if you are resting in the truth of your being, in the love of God, in the Spirit, in Christ, in whatever you want to rest in, but some context bigger than this, there's the possibility you will have some equanimity in the presence of this change, and you will be able to be a gentle, reflective, creative, rather delighted, interested player. While many around you are going to be climbing over the walls, Many of them around you are going to get frightened with denial, which we have already, a massive denial. Then we're going to have repression, many enemies. We need enemies to function in our society, it seems. And we might then have violence. And that's the interesting thing about whether change precipitates revolution which is where you push against the change, like uh, Kuchesko, or Kuchesko, poor guy. Mrs. Kuchesko, we took care of you all as our children. <laughs> it's interesting, like who, how you respond to change. There's them and what happened to them. And look at Ortega, for example, who's our bad guy, supposedly. He said, let the election proceed, and he, he stepped aside. He's got his brother in the military, but <laughs> that's family, that's different. <laughs> now it's no longer nepotism, see? <laughs> oh, we're all so funny. Can you look forward to changes in your lifestyle? Can you look forward to the possibility that the good life 
that is presented on television and in our cultural myths is not the quality life. It's not a life that leads to contentment. I mean, we are less and less safe all the time. Isn't it funny? With all of our technology. Like those old movies in the 20s. I remember it in my house all the time when I grew up in the farm in New Hampshire. We never locked the doors. The screen door was always open. Now you have bolts and double bolts and chains and you still are worried. I have this great image of being in Guatemala with um, my Seva colleagues, working with these um, incredibly beautiful Mayan Indians who have watched, many of the women have watched their husbands and their sons and their parents be murdered before their eyes. And they are just, they have such dignity and beauty and simplicity and their family. And they were they're murdered by really instruments of wealth because they are very poor and when they try to get a step up to get landed so they don't starve to death every year, they get murdered for that. And I went from there directly to Hollywood where I had some business. And I found myself in um, Brentwood, which is a suburb like, um, well, Los Angeles doesn't have suburbs. I guess it's all suburb or some or all center. But it's near Beverly Hills. It's a very exclusive neighborhood. And I was driving down the street, and there were all these huge estates with big stone walls in front of every one of them, and then iron gates that electrically opened. And in front of each one was a little red sign that the security company put up that said, armed response. Lovely. I mean, there's two tulips and daisies and armed response. And I thought, isn't it bizarre? I've just come from a country where the poor people are waiting for the rich to come in and murder them. <laughs> Isn't that far out? That's the instability of it. See, as you begin to trust the balance between the head and the heart, and you tune back into your many identities as part of an ecosystem and part of the family and part of all of it. It seems to me that you have the potential for feeling content. You'll feel at peace with it even as it changes dramatically. It's like riding the wave. When you surf, if you get in relation to the energy correctly, you just have an ecstatic moment. If you don't, <laughs> it's called wipeout. And you and I are learning how to surf, and up comes the ninth wave. changes aren't all just going to be out there. They're going to be changes of the mythic structure. They're going to be changes of what reality is. They're going to be changes of us. We're going to change. It's interesting what allows people to change. In many cultures, they have rites of passage, a ritual where 
like the child is pulled away from the mother and taken off to the mountains for a year and kept there with the men and then comes back in as an adult male in the tribe. So a rite of passage, an initiation process for the change, that's one way. Another way of change is trauma. When crisis, when something so horrible happens, when something happens that blows your model of who you are and how it is, at that moment there is a window, there is a moment of opportunity where you are fresh to see it all clearly. People that have near-death experiences, for example. For me, the absolute fun and excitement and ecstasy of working with somebody who is dying of AIDS, for example, along with the horror and the pain and the sadness and the, the empathy for the, the human predicament, but there is a moment because the illness is so opportunistic and unpredictable and because the social supports are so spotty and unsupportive in many times and because all of the systems are breaking down and all of it and finally the will just keeps weakening and weakening and at one moment it lets go and right there, there are moments when the being is born. And at the moment that the being is born, they know that they aren't the one that's dying of AIDS. It's just my exit line. It's the routine that gets me off the stage. And there's a place in you then that knows there are no errors in the game. That it's all just the way it's supposed to be. My guru, Neem Karoli Baba, kept saying, Ramdas, don't you see it's all perfect? Because I was so in pain about the amount of suffering and violence and torture and all of it in the world. And at the same moment, he would cry over other people's suffering. That's the paradox you and I, as full awakened human beings, have to live with. It is perfect and it stinks. And they're both true. And it is perfect that you are human and feel the pain of the suffering and go into it knowing that your heart is going to break. When I'm with that fellow with AIDS, Part of me is Ram Dass, good, kind person, being with person with AIDS. That's a very little part. Part of me is a fellow soul, each of us with our own storylines, meeting. But both of those models keep us separate. And as long as we are separate into mind, we don't experience the heart-to-heart -heart resuscitation that every human relationship has the potential of providing. So I have to fall into love with this person. open my heart to the boundaryless nature and trust the relation between the mind and the heart again. And know that when I open my heart that wide, the scary thing is that this I'm going to become attached to this being and then this being is going to die and my heart is going to break. And then comes the realization 
that that's in the way of things. That if I do any less than see this being as my beloved, both of us will starve in the relationship. Oh, we'll get some sustenance. Some because the heart leaks through into places. But the full feeding comes from just recognizing we are one in love and we each have our unique stuff to do. The thing that we learn is that we can be in love with people without living out a set of images that come out of movies or somewhere about what you do when you're in love with somebody. Because it's not romantic love. It's emerging in which there is still interpersonal love, so there still is all of the attraction and attachment to the form. So there is still suffering when the form dies and there is still grief. And you realize you're opening yourself to grief and you say, yes, right. And you realize that to embrace suffering of the world, you embrace into that a continuously breaking heart. And for many of you whose heart broke once in your life and you said, I'm never gonna let that happen again. And the second time it happened for you, you said, I'm never gonna let that happen again. And you say, I've been hurt too many times. Well, try it again. Because <laughs> you can't afford not to be hurt. Because you'll starve to death. You'll become all scrunchy. I'm not letting that happen again. I'm not letting you get near me. Don't you let me love you. We can't afford it. See, we're tired of the vice and we're afraid of the cure. So there's rite of passage and there's trauma. And then there's networking that helps the change. I mean, for us to really recognize that we're all here in this room together, sharing these kinds of feelings or relationships to the universe, that empowers us. Not empowers the somebodyness and the specialness. It empowers the deeper intuitive wisdom in us and us to express it uniquely for each of us in our own way. Yeah. You too. It's interesting that all the things that, that we begin to know are common knowledge long before we cop to knowing them. It's like the statistic that since the 60s, for the last 30 years, there has been an increasing curve all the time in the numbers of widows who admit having conversations with their dead husbands. Now, does that mean that 30 years ago, no dead husbands were speaking to their wives? <laughs> or does it mean they weren't listening? <laughs> or does it mean they weren't talking? I think it's the latter two. I think dead husbands have always been speaking to their wives. But I think at a certain stage of the game, you don't listen, and then at another stage, you don't cop to it. You've listened, but I'm not telling you I'm talking to my dead husband. You'll think I'm weird. And then the culture changes, and hey, did you know what? I just spoke to Sam last night. <laughs> no, really? Well, my channel says that. It's 
See, and how many of us, what's the hundredth monkey? How many of us that acknowledge that a new reality is afoot does it take? How many Jewish mothers to change a light bulb? None, I'll sit in the dark. <laughs> that had no relevance to the discussion, I, except in the more profound sense. And then one of the forces that makes us want to change is the, the tension between, uh, that creates the lack of integrity in our being between what we know and how we act. And we keep wanting to bring that together. So when there's an opportunity to change in that direction, we move towards it. And we feel better for having done that. There's another interesting one that um, Joanna Macy's been involved in is um, in order to change, one of the things you have to be able to do is grieve. Because when anything changes, something dies. Like a model of who you were or how you thought the society was or what you thought the game was dies when something new was born. And your ability to allow it to die and to grieve and to emotionally complete the whole thing of the loss, because there was a lot of attachment. I mean, part of healthy growing is the ability to grow into each stage of life, grieving and then letting go of the last stage and then going into the fullness of this stage, like the wisdom of aging. If you hold on to the model of who you are when, you're th when you were 30, when you're 60, you are suffering because you aren't the woman you were or the man you were. On the other hand, as you let go of that model, who you turn out to be, wow. I mean, I get interviewed a lot for, uh, in, in advance when you're on the road, people. You try to get newspaper coverage in cities ahead, so people are constantly asking me these far questions. Like, what was the happiest time of your life? I always say, this time, I don't ever remember being any happier than I am now. I mean, if you like the 60s, you're going to love the 90s. <laughs> People say, don't you miss the 60s? Don't be silly, that was like practice. <laughs> it's just like taking acid as practice for dying. Wow, that was a great trip. Wow. <clears throat> as Tim Leary said, I die so hard each time. <laughs> you keep thinking you're dying. This time I'm really dying. I mean, really, oh, ooh, scary. Hmm. Did you do it yet? No, I'm still doing it. <laughs> well, let me know. <laughs> oh, boy. You gotta take something serious in life. You don't take anything serious, do you? Wavy's convinced us that we, at our board meetings of the Seva Foundation, we always have these uh, eyeglasses in the middle of the table that, you, uh, that are Groucho Marx glasses. And if anybody, as we're dealing with death, blindness, 
homelessness, etc. If anybody uses the word serious, they have to put on the serious glasses. <laughs> so we won't take ourselves too S. This evening's a benefit for Seva. Partly, it's partly a benefit for Hanuman, which pays my salary. Keeps me going to enjoy my colleague. But see, Seva was an attempt, or is an attempt, 11 years ago it started, for a group of people to come together to intentionally create an external institution that reflected their inner truth and to stay as close between that inner truth and that outer institution as we could. I mean, because you join most institutions, you join big organizations, and you feel already there's a deadness in it and a corruption and a kind of a, a people compromised and all that, and they mean well. And you say, well, that's the nature of institutions. <laughs> 